Kent Cove, good morning. Hey guys, I just have to say this. Uh, you guys sound great today. Yeah. So, you know, in this post-COVID or kind of post-COVID or whatever it is that we're in, there are still moments where when, like, like just now for me, I was sitting and I just got swept up in hearing the congregation singing, right? Hearing our voices lifted together in worship, and that's uh, good stuff, amen? amen? All right, so this morning we are concluding our series called Bless, and we are looking at a text Actually, it's one of my favorite stories from the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to read a little bit towards the end of it, and then I'm gonna, we'll talk more about the beginning of it once we get to the sermon. But our text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4. We're going to read 27 to 30, and then we're going to jump down to verse 39. And it reads like this. It says, Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And then, jumping down to verse 39, the story concludes this way. It says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. So to begin this morning, I want to ask you a question. And this is non-rhetorical. In other words, you may respond uh, verbally. I know that's very uncomfortable, but we're going to try it. Who introduced you to your favorite whatever it might be, right? If you think about, um, you know, maybe it's your favorite TV show, maybe it's your favorite food, maybe it's whatever. Uh, think about that question. Who introduced you to your favorite, right? Maybe it's your favorite person, right? Or favorite food or favorite savior. I don't know. But there's this idea, there's this thing that happens, right? When somebody introduces us to something that's so good that we just can't believe it. Who is that person for you and what was that thing? Our story this morning in the Gospel of John is the story of the woman at the well. And I love this story for so many different reasons. And the story basically goes like this. There is Jesus and the disciples come to this town in Samaria, which they shouldn't have been in in the first place. If they were good, religious, uh, religiously observant Jews, they would have gone all the way around, right? But they come to this town. It's the middle of the day. It's hot. They've been traveling. Jesus sends the disciples into town to get food, and he sits at the well by himself. And here comes this woman to draw water. And she draws water, and they have this whole conversation about where we should worship, about the woman's life, about all kinds of stuff. And it's like this super intense conversation that happens seemingly in the frame of, you know, a very short amount of time. They get right to it. Now, as a five on the Enneagram, I appreciate that. You know, I am not a small talk guy. I've learned to a certain extent to do it. Some of you may have experienced my awkwardness in it, but I'm more of a let's be in small groups and let's go deep right away kind of guy. That's how I roll. 
And these two, Jesus engages this woman and they immediately are talking about not just surface things, not the fact that the Mariners are in the playoffs for the first time in however long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what's happening in the world, you know. But they, but they go deep. And Jesus says to this woman, as they're talking, she says, go and get your husband. And the woman says, well, you know, and she kind of hesitates. And Jesus says, no, the man you're with, uh, you've had five husbands, and the man you're now with is not your husband. Right? And instead of this woman being alienated and, and feeling judged, she feels liberated. And that in and of itself is one of the main things I love about this story. Because I would so desperately love if myself and us as Christians were able to name things without making people feel like we were judging them. And the hard fact of the matter is is that very often we are judging them and that's part of the problem, right? But Jesus is able to name this woman's situation in such a way that she doesn't feel judged, she feels liberated. And instead of her going into town and saying, you wouldn't believe this guy I just met at the well. He is the most self-righteous prophet that you've ever heard. He came at me and he was judging me and he was doing that. No, the story goes that she goes back into town and she says, I just met a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? Liberation instead of judgment. Now, one of the other things that just really captures my imagination about this story. So we have all that happens, right? But before she goes back into town, verse 27 happens. Verse 27 reads like this. Just then his disciples returned. Okay, so they've had this conversation about where to worship, who he is, about him giving living water, him naming all of her stuff. All of that has happened. The disciples come back. And I love this because it says his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman. But no one asked, what do you want to the woman, or why are you talking with her? No one asked, but apparently at least one thought. Those questions, right? Why, you know, what is it about us that that's where we go? Immediately, that's where the disciples went. Now, they, they showed some restraint. They didn't verbalize it, at least. But clearly, someone thought it and thought it strong enough that it ended up in the story. But no one asked. Now, why is that here? What's going on here? Now, if you've been around church and you've heard the, this story before, you probably know some of the reasons. One is that in that culture, it was inappropriate for men to speak to women in public, so much so that some rabbis, even uh, while they didn't maybe quite forbid it, they strongly encouraged men to not even speak to their wives in public. Now, that's pretty foreign to the way that we operate, but that's the way it was. It was especially true for a rabbi. Especially true for a rabbi that they would have been very careful to not to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Right? You ever heard that phrase before? That, just so you know, it's not in the, it's not in, it's not in here. Because Jesus demonstrates exactly the opposite over and over and over again. So Jesus engages this woman causing his disciples to wonder. Now, to make it even more apparent, the divide between Jews and Samaritans was so profound that, he, that a good rabbi, an appropriate rabbi, I should say, would have gone to extra lengths to not engage a Samaritan woman. In fact, um, 
I read in, as I was working on this text that in uh, that time that Samaritan women were considered unclean from birth. So, you know, Jewish women, according to the ritual purity laws, they were unclean once a month according to their cycles, right? And they had to go through the whole thing to, to be considered clean. The, the en, enmity, the, the divide between Samaritans and Jews was so deep that Jews considered Samaritan women unclean from birth. In other words, perpetually unclean. And so for Jesus to be engaging, much less having a conversation with, by himself, in public, with a Samaritan woman, was demonstrating a lack of care for propriety that is astounding, that we would have a hard time coming up with a corollary to. So, what is happening here? Now, there's all kinds of other stuff about wells being kind of the meeting place, right? Uh, culturally, um, I love this. I'm just going to read this to you because it's so wonderfully academic in the way it's expressed, but you'll get the point. About what, is, what happens at wells, one commentator writes, Moreover, wells were sometimes places for expressing cross-gender interest. Isaac, Jacob, and Moses met their wives at wells. Such precedent created the sort of potential ambiguity at this well that strict observers of custom wish to avoid. Right? We wouldn't want us people to think that the rabbi was looking for a wife. So this Samaritan woman, we learn, all of that aside... Jesus engages her and points out that she's been married five times, that the current man that she is with is not her husband, and um, and all of that. Now, I want to stop here and just reflect for a minute, because I think there's a traditional way of reading this text that, that does us a little bit of a disservice, and that is that, that, the, that I will call the woman of low reputation interpretation right? We hear this story and we think, well, this, this is a woman of low reputation. This is a woman of loose morals to have five husbands and now be shacked up with somebody who isn't her husband. This is terrible. We take that moralistic approach, right? And maybe that's true. I mean, maybe that's the way it, the way it was. But I want to suggest that if we truly understand the nature of that culture, it could be something other than that. You see, women in that culture had absolutely no power and no volition around marriage. No power and no volition. To the point that a a man in that culture could divorce a woman if they didn't like the bread she served. For whatever reason, they can write her a decree of divorce and send her packing. And she would be an outcast if her family didn't want to take her back in which was likely that they wouldn't. And so the other way of reading this story is that this woman is a victim, that she has been passed around from man to man without any power, and she is just simply trying to survive this life that she has found herself trapped in. You see, it's so easy for us to slide into that place of judgment. Well, well, Clearly, she's made a bunch of bad choices. This is clearly the way, you know, this, and kind of take that moralistic thing. But you'll notice that that's clearly not what happens with Jesus. Because again, what she experienced in her conversation with Jesus was not judgment, but liberation. Jesus saw her. And clearly, when he expressed the realities of her life to her, he did so in such a way that gave her honor as an image bearer, that gave her some sense of hope that this man understands that I am more than my situation in life. And so when we hear this story, we have to resist that impulse. 
And here's, a, here's an impulse that comes to, I think, when we think about things this way, is we must resist our impulse to make Jesus the mascot or representative of appropriateness. <laughs> this is a hard one for us. Because we love that let's avoid the appearance of impropriety and let's avoid those people that perhaps are, you know, have had hard lives. But that's not what Jesus did. So we have to resist the impulse to make Jesus the mascot of appropriateness because he had a preference for the poor and the broken and those on the outside of appropriate. You see, if Jesus cared about looking appropriate, he wouldn't have engaged the woman at all. He would have sent her on her way. But instead, he engages her in not just conversation about herself, but in theological conversation about where is the appropriate place to worship. He sees her as a person of value simply because she bears the image of his father. Now, what I would like for us to do as we think about evangelism is to think about I want us to notice what that kind of welcome does. What, is the, what, what happens in this woman when she experiences the kind of hospitality and welcome that Jesus has just demonstrated to her? Well, we know from reading kind of the context of this verse that this woman is coming to the well at midday, which is not when women came to the well. They came in the morning when it was cool. They don't come to cart that heavy water in the middle of a hot Palestinian afternoon. They come in the cool of the morning. So clearly, she has either, A, felt so, uh, been told flat out that she's not to, to come with the other women, or she feels so ostracized that she doesn't, or she's just so tired of dealing with the, you know, the chatter that she is choosing to come in the middle of the day. So she's apprehensive about engaging her community, probably with very good reason, because she is clearly on the outside. She is clearly in the inappropriate category. So Jesus engages her this way, demonstrates this hospitality and welcome, and it wipes away her apprehension, and she leaves her water jug at the well, and she goes back to town, and she engages the entire town. She engages everybody. Come and meet this man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? Imagine being so filled and so able to demonstrate the love and welcome and mercy of God the Father that it wipes away years of judgment and being ostracized, so much so that the person rushes to tell those very people who have victimized her the good news about this Messiah. She goes and she shares the story. She goes and she shares the story. Then something else happens that I'd like for us to wonder about. Because it's easy for us now to make that leap. I could do that preacher thing where I make the leap to, get, to say, now go share your story. Right? Which I'm going to do in a minute. We'll get there. But what I want to point out is something else. Yes, she goes and shares her story, but what happens? Notice that many of the people, as we read in verse 39, many of the Samaritan, Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. You see, the reason I'm stopping here is because so often we hear this, a text like this, and we jump right to, so go share your story, and yet then some of us are left with, well, I don't really have a story. I just know that Jesus is who he says he is because I have experienced it. I don't have some radical 
uh, transformation story. I don't have some radical story of getting saved and lifted out of, you know, this, that, or the other thing, right? And oftentimes that gets lost because it's easy. That's the dramatic place to go. But the reality is, is that this woman goes and shares her story, and it says that many in the town believe because of her story. So they don't have necessarily that same story, but they believe because of that story. And so I just wanted to stop and think about that because I want, for those of you for whom you have not experienced some radical transformation or rescue because of your belief in Jesus, that you are no lesser of a disciple you still can share the story because it still matters to you, right? It doesn't have to be this dramatic thing because right here in this very story, many in the town, it says, believed, on, on, or believed in Jesus because of her story. So your story doesn't need to be dramatic, the, thec- the second thing I wanna, uh, want you to think about is um, what is your story? So it's helpful to, to remind yourself of that, right? So perhaps your story is you heard or you experienced the love of God in this way or that, you know, however it was that you came to know him. That's your story and that's okay. My story is, is that I grew up in a Christian home, and some of my earliest memories are of my parents going off to church meetings at night and the babysitter coming, right? And it seemed like every night of the week. I know it wasn't, but that's, you know. Um, my story is also that when I was in high school, I experienced depression to a depth that I was, uh, had suicidal ideation. And through counseling and and getting reconnected to my faith, I experienced Jesus' healing. Now, I do not mean to say that I was healed from depression because I still struggle with it. So I'm not saying that, but I was healed in that moment. I was delivered from that trial. I experienced healing in, uh, in those months and weeks because I experienced the Jesus of this story. I experienced the Jesus who saw my brokenness and my desperation and my uh, loneliness and all of the teenage angst that I had, circa 1985 or 86. And he didn't judge it, but he welcomed me. And he loved me with radical acceptance. That's my story. I have more stories beyond that, but that's one of them. And so what is your story? The second thing I want you to think about is who is your community? Who is it that you are uniquely positioned to go and tell? And here's the hard part. It might be the very people who wounded you the most. It might be. Not saying it necessarily is. I'm not encouraging anybody to go into abusive situations or anything like that. But in this particular story, the very community that this woman went and told is the very community of of at least a good portion of her wounding. So who is your community? Who will you share the story with and invite? And invite. And then lastly, how... I want you to just notice the tone of what happened here. You'll notice that the woman did not go into town and pass out tracts. She did not go into town and argue with people about theology or doctrine or whatever the moral crusade of the day was. What did she do? She issued an invitation. Come and meet this man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? You see, so often we decide that it's our job to take on the work of the Spirit and convince people. Our job is to just tell the story and issue the invitation. Could he be? Might he be the one? 
Now, for some of us, that's really hard because we like to argue and we know us some doctrine and theology and we're more than happy to tell you how yours is screwed up. But that's not what happened here. What happened here was this man named my life and set me free. Could he be the Messiah? And so a posture of openness is more inviting than one of argument. And then the last question I want you to think about as we go today is who will you seek out intentionally? As we wind up this BLESS series, this whole series is about giving you some tools that you can intentionally use to build relationships with folks so that you might earn, hear me, earn the opportunity to share your story. Okay, there's a whole other sermon that we don't have time for this morning right there. We don't automatically get the right to speak into people's lives. We have to earn it. So how do we do that? I want you to think about and make a list, if you haven't already, of two to three people to intentionally build a relationship with. To intentionally build a relationship with. And then use these tools that we've given, the the acronym BLESS. Begin with prayer. Pray for these folks, not because you have decided that they are your target, but because you have decided that you want relationship with them. You want to know them. You want to be their friend. You want to know what breaks their heart. You want to walk with them in sorrow. You want to walk with them in joy. You want to uh, develop a relationship, right? So begin with prayer. And then listen with care. Learn to listen to really listen, and this means that you have to learn how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It means that when these people express their deep pain or regret or woundedness by the church or their deep doubts about who God might be or their questions about all of those things, you have to learn to be comfortable and not provide answers immediately. Listen with care. Third one was E, eat together. Right? Invite them into your home. Invite them out to lunch. Have a meal together. Have more than one meal together. Build that relationship. Have those conversations that only happen around a table. Serve them with love. Find ways to serve them in simple ways or in big ways, whatever presents itself. And then finally, when invited, share the story. And I think if we lived intentionally in this way, we would see the opportunity over and over again to say to our friends and our families and those we have relationship with, come and meet this man. Could he be the Savior? Amen.